My buddy Robert Sykes, also known as Keto Savage, is a force to reckon with, big in the bodybuilding, the keto space, and has a very successful entrepreneur. He shares so much wisdom as he brings together health, wealth, and uh, even regenerative agriculture and homesteading. Always enjoy visiting with my good buddy, Robert Sykes, uh, Keto Savage. Uh, good to see you, my friend. Um, just, uh, you know, as, as much as you're a dear friend of mine, I, you're you're also somebody that I get so much inspiration from as you've just gone through, uh, you know, attacking the health space, uh, the business, the uh, everything with that sowing prosperity we're, we're trying to bring together, the regenerative agriculture, and something that I just felt like we had to get together and share is your new venture into homesteading. So, man, I'm so excited to be able to visit and hear all the things that you are doing, you and Crystal and uh, the little man just growing up on a homestead is just, uh, you know, it's music to my ears. So what's uh, what's the latest with you, my friend? Hey, man. Well, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure chatting with you as well. Uh, the latest for me as far as the homesteading ventures go. So we have sheep now we've got chickens we're going to be getting some pigs we just got a puppy uh so he's keeping us busy as well him, him and rigel um he's probably they're probably about the same if you're counting puppy years on him so they're both just two terrors <laughs> two terrors i love it so robert i want to i want to get your perception on how how health and entrepreneurship and just the regenerative side of of food and and you know uh, just the way things are really being ran from the the backside almost like this corporatocracy that we live in with the, the government and everything why how is that together how does that run together for you or are you able to articulate that cuz i i've definitely struggled with it. it makes sense to me but how do you rationalize that or explain how interconnected those things are so I like to, um, I'm going to back way up here and talk about how I view my life as a, in totality. Uh, so everybody talks about balance and work-life balance, and I've always kind of strayed away from that. I think balance is bullshit, frankly. Uh, I like to view my life through this lens of tensegrity. Uh, so basically, it's an architectural concept of tensional integrity and basically opposing forces pull against one another, but that tension creates increases uh, structural resilience, basically. Um, and I try to view my life through that lens as opposed to this balance uh, view. Because if, if something's perfectly balanced, then it's it's at zero. It's nothing's getting better, nothing's getting worse. It's just at zero. And I don't want to live my life at zero. So with Tensegrity in mind, I, I've kind of broken my life into five primary pillars, health, wealth, relationships, spirituality, and self-improvement. And all five of those components build on one another. They may seem Un, unrelated and inter, not interconnected, but they all are. And if everything is rising, then the whole ship, you know, is strengthened, so to speak. Um, so for me, health and wealth have kind of come, you know, hand in hand. Like I built my business with my passion in fitness and nutrition and ketogenic diet, uh, bodybuilding, things of that nature. I coach people. But then when you dive deeper into nutrition and optimizing your health, you have to take a pretty primary focus on where that food comes from, what you're feeding your body. Uh, so that really kind of plays on regenerative agriculture, sourcing quality foods, eating quality meats, animal sourced uh, proteins and fats. And when you start diving down that rabbit hole, you just find out about this whole homesteading, rotational grazing, regenerative agriculture movement that is very anti beef as a commodity system. And the deeper I've dove into that, it's also kind of filled that self improvement pillar of my tensegrity model because I'm just becoming more self sufficient. And I'm raising my son, my family within a homesteading environment. So everything is interconnected. I was actually speaking at the White Oak Pasture Seminar this past weekend, and people were trying to bridge the gap between health and wellness and, you know, sourcing quality beef. And I feel like it all goes together. It's all symbiotic in nature. So I think there's absolutely an interconnectedness, interconnectedness here. 
I love that. I love that. I didn't realize you were down at White Oak. Uh, that yeah. is some of my favorite people. I love I love Will, Jenny, Jody. They're just absolutely incredible. So tell tell me a little bit about that. What what was that uh, conference like? And and are you being more involved with those regenerative ag conferences? Yeah. Well, I mean, I spoke. You're rooted in regeneration. Um, unveiling of that documentary with Will. And then yep. I got invited to speak at his Rooted in Regeneration conference this past weekend because one of his former interns is one of my former clients. So he kind of got me in touch. I had Will on the podcast, uh, and then they invited me to come down there and speak. And I was speaking on fitness, nutrition, the ketogenic diet, and entrepreneurship. And it was crazy because most of the people there are not my primary demographic that I'm speaking to at a conference. But right. the people that are in the keto space, they want to eat quality food. The people that are there – you know, homesteading and raising their own livestock, they want to find a market to sell that food. So, I mean, it goes perfectly hand in hand. Uh, so, yeah, I've definitely been trying to get more involved because I think everything is so linked. And I don't think it's going to be that much to bridge that gap because we're all wanting the same thing. So thoroughly enjoyed the conference. Um, we were there from Thursday until Sunday. I spent quite a bit of time with Will and Jenny and the whole team. And we toured the farm. They gave me a private tour of their processing plant. I worked out there at the gym <laughs> several several days that week. I was rocking your sewing prosperity shirt the whole time. Uh, so yeah, man, it was a good, it was a good time for sure. I love that, man. There there are so many of us coming together that it's just so exciting, and there's so much hope to go with it. And I love how the you know some of the the keto gone carnivore have really embraced the regenerative ag movement like in a way that i don't think very many other you know groups have and that just gives me so much more hope and the influence so it's probably you know th probably 33% at regenerative ag on the podcast and it dividing up in thirds with health and then um carnivore cancer so what I have noticed there is that the farmers are maybe maybe just a half a step behind embracing it or understanding it, but they're being exposed to it over and over and over how important that health topic is. So you given that presentation, uh, what was the feedback? What was the the audience that maybe that wasn't your primary demographic, but what are they giving you or what's that feedback like? It was great, man. I mean, everybody was very tuned in to, um, because like, like I said, everybody there raises their own food. They're wanting to figure out ways to market that food and reach an audience that they can do so. And if they're trying to just do things locally, that's great. I mean, I'm all about building the community, but there's a much broader demographic out there in the keto carnivore space that they can tap into if they're willing to ship or find, find those places, even if it's just local gyms and things of that nature, because the people that are trying to optimize their health and wellness especially if they're following a keto carnivore diet, they know, I mean, they're predominantly eating meat. Like I put up a couple of slides on my presentation about, you know, I consume four pounds of beef a day, roughly, you know, like if you extrapolate that out of the course of a year, that's a lot of money in meat. And these people are trying to move their product and find buyers for that quality product. And they're, they're needing to charge a premium for it because it is a higher quality food and it's not going through that beef commodity system. And the people that are interested in their health and wellness, they're totally fine paying a premium because they know and want that quality option. Um, so yeah. I don't I don't think there's many barriers to entry. There's not many roadblocks between bridging that gap. Um, and they were all very interested in it from a health and wellness standpoint, because a lot of them, you know, if they're raising their own meat, they're eating all the right stuff. They may just be also including a bunch of unnecessary carbohydrates and sugars because they're not really well versed on keto and carnivore, what that entails. But I, I talked with all of them. They all came up to me afterwards with questions about what to do different with their own diet personally. So it was pretty cool, man. It was a pretty cool networking experience for sure. There's going to be several collaborations that come as a result of that. That's that's beautiful. I'm so glad you were able to to go down there and make that. So let's talk on an, an angle that I've I've really been passionate about, and that is the health and optimization of of the entrepreneur, right? Like. It is so much easier to push through these times of stress, that entrepreneurial roller coaster that that we can get on when we're healthy uh, or when we're facing adversity. So what does it mean to you to be, you know, optimized uh, physically, mentally, emotionally as you go about running, you know, multiple businesses? 
Yeah, so I mean, my business, like I want everything in my life to to be symbiotic in nature. Like I don't want there to be competing or distracting components. So I'm passionate about health, fitness, nutrition, the ketogenic diet, bodybuilding. So I wanted to build a business that encompassed all of those things as opposed to having a totally unrelated business. That way, anytime I'm working on one, it's inherently building the other. And for me, you know, business, as you know, can be all kinds of roller coasters, all kinds of highs and lows and ups and downs. You know, one moment you can feel like you're on top of the world, the next moment you feel like you're in the pits of hell. And for me, having a solid foundational baseline with my training and nutrition provides me with a solid foothold that I can leverage to crawl out of whatever hell I find myself in at a given time. So that is always consistent. My training is always on point. My nutrition is always on point. And whatever my goals are at the time, you know, kind of dictate how I break that nutrition and training up. Like I just got done doing a competition prep in which I got down to 3.9% body fat and went pro, mm. but I can't sustain that indefinitely. Like that's not a healthy thing to sustain. So there's periods in which I'm optimizing for a certain type of performance. And there's periods at which I'm just trying to maintain a healthy baseline and continue to build muscle over time. And if I incorporate that as my day to day, then it just simply becomes part of the day. Like for me, going to the gym and training and staying on top of my nutrition is the same mental bandwidth as brushing my teeth. Like it's just part of the day. It doesn't really, it doesn't really take much yeah. out of me. It just is what it is. Uh, but having that as a solid baseline, as a, as a norm has allowed me to always be consistent and even keel and, you know, cool headed with regards to any of the business decisions I make. Cause if I didn't train, if I wasn't on top of my nutrition, then my ability to make good decisions within the business would be significantly hindered. Absolutely. So what, what advice would you give what, uh, these agpreneurs, these, uh, these farmers that are running these, I mean, it's such an important business. It's the, you know, it's the, the foundation of, of society are, is food production. So what advice do you give Robert to, to the, to our farmers, especially, you know, these regenerative guys that are taking on, you know, more of a maybe a perceived risk of going against the grain of uh, conventional agriculture. But as far as being healthy and running a business, what advice do you have? Well, the thing is, a lot of these agricultural, you know, based businesses are based, you know, in the Midwest and the South, uh, in certain regions where it's just stereotypical to eat a lot of good Southern fried foods and, and just kind of like do all the unhealthy things. And that's not really what you want to do. Like you, you have access to a great quality food source on what you're producing yourself. So remove the things that are subtracting from that are adding noise to the equation and just simply dial in your nutrition around the meat that you're producing. That's going to solve a lot of problems right there. Plus, if you look at it from a business standpoint, you know, we all are our own brand. Like every individual should think of themselves as a brand and first impressions are everything and if you're walking around, you know, 300 pounds overweight, type two diabetic, you're going to have a harder time moving your product, especially if you're trying to cater to the health focused demographic, if you're not healthy yourself. So I feel like if you're a better representation of what health can be provided by eating your product, then people can be much more tuned to purchasing that product. So I think people need to look at it through that lens. But also, I mean, there, there's so much there's it goes so deep. I mean, like what it does to the environment, what it does to. Uh, you know, the community, like there's so many things, there's so many different facets that we can take this. And I feel like if people, you know, bring that to light, then the consumer is going to have no problem at all paying that premium price point for a higher quality product that they know is sourced well, that has a better amino acid and nutrient profile, and is also contributing to the betterment of the environment and the community. So I think it's an easy sell. It's just a matter of, you know, portraying that information in a way that, that grasps the attention of people. I love that. So I I really want to go back to to that framework that you put together because I have started homeschooling my kids, uh, my oldest two. So it's fourth, third grade roughly. And what I've done is created the like sewing prosperity curriculum is for from almost a homeschool standpoint, but then able to translate that into like these type of conversations as, as we grow it and get bigger. And so what I have actually done is I – instead of having the the five that you do, I focused in on three trying to maybe, maybe simplify it a little bit in at least my mind, but it is, uh, it's health, it's wealth and it's production. And what I did with that is I had it mirror, uh, honestly, the, the, the constitutional framework of life, 
liberty and pursuit of happiness. And so what, what I'm, I'm trying to teach my kids is it's health. We get into science, we get into nutrition, we get into all of that, that encompasses, uh, health, right? I just feel like that's the first pillar that I need to focus on with them. Wealth is about this. We get into math. We get into uh, all of the things that come into running a business or building a business from the more, more of the back end side, the administrative knowledge that we have to have. And then production, it gets into more of the trades. It gets into agriculture. It gets into carpentry. We get into all kinds of little things that the hands on with physics and things that they really, really love. But I wanted to mirror that in a way that I'm teaching them that these are what we should have, these constitutional rights in life, mirroring that with health, liberty, this is wealth, we have to have freedom, right? Our our idea of liberty and wealth is a lot different from a country that's ran by a dictator, right? Like it's it, this has, has some, you know, con... <laughs> We, we just have to address the liberty component with wealth, in my opinion. And then mm-hmm. the pursuit of happiness. I feel like we're, we are uh, happy we're, it, to the degree at which we're producing something and we're creating. So from the biblical preaching, I feel like we are created in the image of God and God is the ultimate creator and that the act of creating, of building something positive, it gives us this fulfillment. So I said all that to say um, – how how do you feel as a coach, as as somebody that's experienced and lived out all these things, that I can help build out a way of 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 teaching my kids and then the greater sowing prosperity platform? Well, first of all, I love that framework, man. I think that's awesome. I think we need more of that in the education system for sure. I think Anything that people can do to become more hands-on engaged with real-life applications is absolutely key. I mean, I'm, I'm 32 years old. You know, I went to the traditional public school system, but I think, you know, not, not to toot my own horn, but I'm oftentimes light years ahead of my peer group when it comes to critical thinking skills, and I think that is a result of being raised on property, on land, out in a rural community. I mean, I was, you know, driving tractors and chainsaw when I was – nine years old. And I feel like you do that and you have a better sense of, you know, risk, you have a better sense of situational awareness, your environmental factors, and that transcends the actual act of whatever you're doing, but into just critical thinking skills abroad. And I feel like there's a massive component of that that's missing in the current curriculum. And people are oftentimes taught things they don't need to know and taught very little of what they do need to know. So I think the more hands-on you can get people with actually using their hands, having situational awareness, and just having these critical thinking skills is key. And if you're doing that from a wealth and a health standpoint and a production standpoint, a creative standpoint, then then that's going to really bode well for preparing people, especially the, the youth, for life. You know, we're, we're, we're shoved into this funnel, this system that is a broken model to begin with. Like people are sucked dry of their creative components. They, they don't have the ability or the freedom or the permission to be creative. But that that's, that's an incredible misfortune. Like there's so many businesses and entrepreneurs out there that are thriving because they broke free of that system and allowed themselves that creativity. And I think if you can foster that in growing, developing children at the onset, as opposed to forcing them through this model that just teaches them to go to school, go to college, get a career, retire, and then, sit on a beach drinking Mai Tais for the rest of your life and not creating anything like that. That's not a f- sense of fulfillment. It's going to come from that. Like you have to build something with your own two hands. You have to create value in a way that's bigger than yourself. And I think any way you can integrate that into their educational system, the better. I love it. So, um, as, as we, we go into the role of a parent, like, there's not really a guidebook, right? Like I, I remember back when Lander was born, my oldest, and we were handed a baby to leave the hospital. That was like the most terrifying experience of my life. Like y'all trust me with this, this, this thing, this baby, <laughs> we're supposed yeah. to keep it alive. So how have you adjusted uh, to, to that being a parent in the first, um, uh, what you're, you're right under two years? Roughly, yeah, he's he's, uh, he's almost two. He'll be two in May, so getting close. Two in May. So tell me about that first two years in your experience with everything that you're juggling. 
it's been it's been interesting, man. Like I um honestly I I never even entertained relationships. I didn't date at all through high school and college because I thought that relationships would be distracting towards my business endeavors. Then I met Crystal and she was only supportive. So I'm okay. Let's let's double down on this. Like let's she's part of the team. Let's let's tackle the world together. And that amplified the, the results. And before we had a kid, I was kind of under the same impression. I'm like, hey, having a kid is going to be a distraction and it's going to hinder my pursuits and endeavors. But after having him, it's like he gives me reason to have all these pursuits yeah. and endeavors. And it, it's made me focus on it that much more. And yeah, you have to be much more mindful of how you're spending your time. Like all of my hours are accounted for. There's no wasted time throughout my day. Like I want to be as productive with the business during business hours and as present with him as I can be when I'm with him. But I think the beautiful thing for us in our scenario is that we've reached a point with the business where Crystal does very little with the actual workings of the business. So she's able to stay home and just be with him the entirety of the day. So we're going to go the whole homeschooling route as well. But I mean, the fact that she's able to be home is huge because we don't have to ship him off to a daycare. He doesn't have to be funneled into the system at an early age. Like I've got friends that had kids at the same time we did and they'll get like a total cumulative time of one and a half hours with their kid every single day yes. after they get back from a daycare. And yep. to me, like, I don't want to raise my kid that way. Like, I love the fact that we're on land now, that he's with his mom all day long, and that I'm present with him when I get home from work. Yep. And we're doing things that he wouldn't do else elsewhere. Like, he rides the lawnmower around with me. He rides a tractor with me. He goes checks on the chickens to get the eggs every day. He loves that kind of stuff. And I feel like that has been and will be, you know, key to, to laying that proper foundation for him. It, absolutely. I think that's spot on. I think that what you just said was why the wealth component is so unbelievably important because if we can't afford to stay home because we didn't learn these basic fundamental ideals and practices around money and around finances because we don't we don't we don't learn that in the traditional sense unless we're fortunate enough to have, have a, a mentor or a parent that's able to instill those lessons i think that that was kind of to bring it all together rather the, the the prosperity aspect of it the resources being able to be created based off of entrepreneurship is so vital to giving us this freedom and flexibility so uh what what are like those what are, what are some of your your foundational things to start that education process uh for for somebody that may be uh trying to get started uh on on their own uh as far as like building their own business and kind of pursuing yeah. that passion yeah. man main thing for me is like you have to like a lot of people try to pursue business that seems lucrative but they're not emotionally attached to like they'll hear about, you know, Bitcoin or they'll hear about day trading or they hear about some, you know, newfangled thing that's promising them to get rich quick, but they don't have any underlying passion associated with them. And as you can attest, like if there's not any passion, then there's not going to be any staying power because there's going to be highs and lows. Like nothing is, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. And there's been multiple times within my business where it's like, this is a freaking grind. It's brutal. I'm putting in 18 hour days nonstop. And if I wasn't passionate about the work that I was doing, I would have tapped out long ago. But because I'm not doing the work just simply for financial gain, but because I'm actually adding more value and I, I believe in it, I believe in the work and I see the fruits of my labor and the health of people improving, you know, it, it allows me to get through those sticking points. And I feel like so many businesses fail because they don't get through those sticking points because they don't have that underlying passion. So I think from a very high level approach, like pursue an entrepreneurial venture that you would do if there was no money at the end of the tunnel to begin with, like pursue mm -hmm. something that you're doing every single day anyways, and that you enjoy doing every single day. Otherwise you're not going to have that staying power. I love it, brother. There's, there's been uh, lots of times it would be probably easier to just throw your hands up in the air and be done with it than to, to put your head down and get to work. Um, Cause if somebody has not ran their own business, they cannot actually relate to how difficult and challenging yeah. it can be. Uh, and, and so, you know, that goes, I guess, goes without saying that it's such an important role that I feel like entrepreneurs, uh, farmers, I, 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 I think farmers are entrepreneurs and I think there may be some 
massive disconnect there uh, in how how they view themselves sometimes. But it is such an unbelievable journey of entrepreneurship uh, with, with agriculture. I think Will has done an amazing job of taking that to to another level. Right? He's taken what he had, uh, I think, when he started like two people, minimum wage, working the farm, and now he's up to over 100 plus people in the different a- areas that he's built out at White Oak Pasture. So what uh, what can you advise somebody that has that homesteading passion, that homesteading desire to be self-sufficient and yet still make it something that could have this profitable potential. Well, I was actually talking to, um, I was training somebody there because there's like that little gym. You've, you've been there. So to get that little gym next to the yeah. process plant. And I was going there to work out and um, I invited somebody, I invited anybody that wanted to come to train with me at five o'clock in the morning. And I had a few takers, which was surprising, but I did have a few. And one of them uh, is a homesteader. She's got her own brand. She's got a great following on Instagram and she just simply has built courses around doing these certain skill sets. And I feel like that would be a very great way to create content, create value around developing these skills and teaching it to others. And she's doing incredibly well. I mean, it's a profitable venture for, her. and you're able to do that at home. You're able to create that content. You're able to document that journey. And then you're able to offer value to somebody in the form of that content that they can then use and apply in their own lives. And the, the thing about like creating content that a lot of people get hung up on, and I think it's a big barrier to entry in people's minds, is that they don't view themselves as an expert subject in the subject matter, and they don't feel like they're qualified to teach it. But the beautiful thing about content creation is that people relate with other people. So if other people are getting into it and they have questions, they're going to want to share that journey with you. So if you document your journey, the highs, the lows, the failures, and the successes, there's going to be a lot more buy-in there. So if you're simply creating content around the skill sets that you're learning for the first time yourself and acquiring, and then get to the point where you can teach it to others, like that is totally fine. People can create a course, they can create a book, they can create all different types of ventures, all different types of mediums that offer that value to people that they can then monetize. Uh, but yeah, doing like a coursework style model uh, with these skill sets from a homesteading standpoint would be a, probably the route that I would take for sure. That's an uh, incredible, incredible advice. So, brother, what's what's next for y'all? What are you doing um, for for the next? What's twenty twenty four look like for you and Crystal? Uh, what's uh, what's the big goals, my friend? Man, there are a bunch of them. Uh, twenty twenty four, like my, I do a manifesto every single year. So, my manifesto for twenty twenty four is uh, reflect, recalibrate, and reengage. I want to basically just refine and polish all the different components of my life this year, get everything organized. And we're launching a course specific to ketogenic bodybuilding uh, here very soon. Like we're actually going to do the beta launch probably this weekend. And this has been a course that I've been working on for the past four years. It's a behemoth of a course, speaking of courses. And we're going to get that launched, get that polished up. And then that should be a a pretty big thing for us. Uh, But then from a homesteading standpoint, we're just going to keep getting more animals, man. Like I said, we got the chickens now. We got uh, the sheep and we got the dog. But we're about to get some pigs. We're going to get more chickens. We're going to get meat chickens. We're doing the whole rotational grazing protocol. So I've been learning all kinds of things there, some successes, some failures. And uh, we're just going to be totally self-sufficient with our food production. Um, so I'm super excited about that. Plus, I've got several hunting trips lined up to procure more more food to fill the freezer um, and just rock and roll on all the business fronts, man, rock and roll with keto brick, get that more refined and polished. We're bringing on some more people to the team and that we're just creating more content along the way. I love it, brother. I love it. Um, so just about everybody that I talk to, um, knows you. And so I didn't realize that you had been around, you know, cause to me, you're, you're my buddy, Robert from here in Arkansas. All right. Like we, We've known each other forever. So like talk to say somebody like Ken Berry or Bill Schindler or everybody's like, Hey, do, well, do you know Robert Sykes? Yes, yes, I do. Yeah. And it, it's just been incredible. So what's it like to have been in this, this, uh, keto field, this keto world for honestly, for a long time, you granted, you may be 30, 32, but like, it feels like you have as much experience as a lot of these much older people in this realm. So what's it like to honestly be one of the, the, the OGs in this space? 
I mean, it feels good, man. Like I came to keto by accident um, and I came to it before there was people talking about it. Like I came into the diet and lifestyle before there were books and podcasts and websites on the subject matter. So as it was growing in popularity and as there was more information being put out, I was right there on the front line putting out information myself. Uh, and with that, you you garner a certain degree of respect from people that are you know, movers and shakers in the field. And I feel very blessed and fortunate to know all these people and consider them all friends. Uh, but yeah, it's a very, it's a very close knit community, man. Like people that have been here for the long haul and that are in here for the right reasons, uh, which most of them are, there's just a, a brotherhood, a camaraderie there that, that doesn't exist in a lot of other dietary lifestyles. Uh, so I'm super passionate about it. I'm super passionate about knowing these people, connecting these people, networking with these people and just spreading the message and growing the movement. And I think that's what it's going to take, man. It's going to be a grassroots, organic, uh, from the bottom up style approach. Like as you and I have talked about before, we're not going to be getting uh, revised nutritional guidelines from the governmental bureaucratic agencies. Like this is going to have to come from the people that are seeing the changes in their own life and those of their loved ones. Uh, so just simply being a part of that movement on the ground floor, boots on the ground, rocking and rolling alongside my other fellow keto dieters, man, is, is what I love doing. It's it's great. You you've done a amazing job with everything. The discipline, the the work you've put in is obviously a huge part of uh everything coming to fruition. So uh, you know, grateful to to uh have your friendship, uh to have somebody that is passionate uh on, you know, you're 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 what, almost three hours away from me now. But uh man, I, it's just it's so exciting to see our generation putting in work and making change. And there's so many more than I ever realized. It's not just uh, the sprinkling like I thought it was initially. There, there's a lot and it's a force. And so cannot recommend Keto Savage, the podcast, the Keto Bricks, everything you're doing. And of course, the like the, the homesteading content is uh, it's exploding. Like Joel just came out with a book, The Homesteading Tsunami. I mean, like it's a it's a huge deal. And I think you're you're going to be uh on that wave too, helping so many more people. I certainly hope to, man. I mean, I feel like it's made a profound shift in my life, the quality of my life, those that I love. So anybody that I can touch in the same way to just have them take advantage of all that it has to offer, man, that's what I want to do. So can't thank you enough for doing the work that you're doing, man. The podcast that you've got, spreading the word, building people up in the local community. Like that's what it's all about. Thank you, brother. All right. Well, Keto Savage. Robert, thank you for uh, for joining, my friend. I know you got lots of stuff to do. Appreciate you, Logan, man. We'll talk soon, and I'll, I'll be in your neck of the woods before 12 for long. I'm going to have to meet up in person. Perfect. Thank you for joining us on Sewing Prosperity. Be sure to follow along across the social media platforms, including YouTube, and be sure to go to sewingprosperity.com.